Thank, thanks very much, Gary, for your very kind introduction. And many, many thanks to all of you for coming, to, uh, coming here this evening. Um, 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 and some of you are actually from uh, quite far too, so I, I'm actually I'm, I'm quite overwhelmed uh, seeing all of you uh, here, here tonight, so thanks very much again. Now, when I first started at Harriet Watt back in 2000, January 2000, it was, a cold, it was cold and dark, as you can imagine, not like today at all. But there was, there was tangible relief uh, here that we'd survived the Y2K Millennium computer uh, bug, uh, for those of you who remember this. So you can see that the nostalgic theme's already starting. <laughs> And, but as, so in my first year here, uh, and as part of a staff development course for new lecturers, uh, one piece of particularly useful advice that I've retained from that time was simply to keep thanking people. Um, so briefly, I would, uh, at the start, uh, I'd, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to everyone, my partner Stephen, my family, friends and colleagues here in Edinburgh and beyond. As well as, as well as my students, everyone who's helped or encouraged me um, over the years along the way. And as you know, the uh, Harriet Watt inaugural lecture series aims to introduce newly appointed professors and their research. And uh, I should therefore confess in 2019 that uh, I actually became professor back in 2015. But, but, um, but as many as you know, I had some health issues to contend with afterwards. So uh, I would again like to offer my heartfelt thanks to everyone who supported me uh, through this. And obviously a special mention also for the NHS, sta NHS staff at St. John's and the Western General Hospitals, as well as the team at the Maggie Centre here in Edinburgh. So I can really now say that I'm especially pleased to be here with you uh, all tonight over three years later. And as they say, better late than never. Um, so I suppose that after seeing the, um, the poster for my talk, questions that might occur are why nostalgia, why music um, or, or popular music, why French, the French language, culture and society, and indeed why popular music in France and in French. Uh, hopefully this will be become a bit clearer uh, during my talk, but to start with, I think it's actually worth us taking some time to consider the kind of learning, knowledge and understanding and skills that those of us in French and in modern languages more generally, at least within the UK higher education context, are seeking to develop um, um, in general. So, and I actually do this quite deliberately, as there can still be misunderstandings as to what the study of modern languages in universities involves. and. While Harriet Watt enjoys a long and sustained reputation for its specialised provision in translating, interpreting and intercultural studies, this is underpinned by the learning outcomes that many higher education providers around the country seek to foster. And um, here they are set out um, in the uh, QAA Undergraduate Languages, Cultures and Societies benchmark statement, for example. So you'll, you'll see that four key elements typify the knowledge and understanding of outcomes of programmes in languages. Um, explicit knowledge of the language, and in my case that's French. Uh, use of the target language um, for purposes of, and again French in my case, for purposes of understanding, expression and communication with others. Knowledge of aspects of the cultures, communities and societies where the language is used. And, and viewing this in broader terms, perhaps, um, intercultural awareness, understanding and competence. So while use of the target language, explicit knowledge of the language and knowledge of the cultures, societies uh, and communities are, are fairly self-explanatory, I think it's worth just unpacking the final point on intercultural awareness. What does that actually mean? Well, you've got a, a whole series of um, bullet points there, but really just to uh, boil them down, essentially learners then uh, of, in language studies are able to compare cultures and societies. They're able to understand, appreciate and evaluate critically their own cultures and other cultures, and they are able to engage with and function in other cultures. And as you can see from uh, another list we have here, uh, language studies covers a considerable and diverse range of areas. And you can, as I say, you can see that in the first uh, four bullet points, which I'm not going to uh, pour through. But um, as a whole, then, we might say then that languages, language, study, uh, language studies may be regarded as a field which is particularly multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, uh, intercultural and uh, applied. 
And just to bring things back closer to home then, the, the current projects that I'm working on perhaps give an idea of the, of, uh, the range of interests and directions um, in my particular area within modern languages and French studies covering representations um, at the moment of key figures in French popular culture, like the comedian, actor and humanitarian Coluche, um, and the popular, musician, popular musicians such as Serge Gainsbourg and Johnny Hallyday, uh, posthumous celebrity, uh, health narratives uh, and uh, LGBTQ coming out stories. Um, but well, before I pursued French as an academic interest, a curiosity in other cultures needed to be stimulated through formal education. But the significance of my own personal experience and exposure, at times uh, very early exposure to other cultures, and sometimes by chance, um, was important too, I think. In my own case, um, as a child growing up in the 1970s and 80s, uh, my own exposure, mainly via television, was limited until I started secondary school and studied French. Um, but with the benefit of hindsight, I can now identify cultural and musical experiences from my past that have contributed to my interest. And the very fact that I'm here now mentioning these uh, all these years later shows, I think, how significant they are on a personal level. And thanks to the, you know, the advent of uh, the internet and, and YouTube and, and other uh, websites, it's been possible for me to revisit, and others, to revisit uh, such moments and use them to rationalise my own personal trajectory and, uh, and also identify and reinforce some of the features that I've gone on to um, explore and highlight in my own uh, academic work. Right, as you can see, as you can see from this picture of me, uh, with what was known then as the stereogram, um, as a child, I was an avid collector of seven-inch singles, um, and thanks to my parents who, who generously uh, indulged this habit. And um, here you can see, uh, on the left, you can see me getting the playlist ready for a, a birthday, uh, birthday party. Um, and so obsessed was I with playing the records that in the summer months, I would take my record player out onto the back garden I don't know if anybody else has done this, but anyway, take it onto the back garden, but not really quite realising that hot sun and black vinyl are not a, a very good combination. Um, an early introduction to the French language and um, somewhat stereo rep stereotypical representations of Frenchness occurred when I was, a very, was very young, around six years old. My parents bought me a copy of Chanson d'Amour by the US Vocal Harmony Group Man Manhattan Transfer a cover of a song written by Wayne Shanklin and originally recorded by Art and Dotty Todd back in 1958. Now, what was particularly distinctive for me at the time was Janice Siegel singing the lead vocal in, in the style of Edith Piaf with a strong, passionate vibrato and the recreation of French words which I didn't understand and sounds, particularly those nasal vowels that we don't normally uh, hear in English, en, en, un, un, if you'd like to repeat after me. Um, um, the, the French beret worn by uh, Tim Houser is another reference to stereotypical Anglophone views of Frenchness. And I should also mention the attraction of the vinyl record itself, which in recent years, has in, as you know, has enjoyed a resurgence in uh, popularity. And, and for me, the, uh, you can see it there, the Atlantic label at that age, the age of six, signified a cheerfulness with its light green and orange um, uh, colours and uh, um, incidentally as you can see one of my uh, favourite colours now. So, um, so I'll just give you a quick snatch of the song. Uh, here you've got a studio, ver so the studio version but, um, but also showing, you, but it's, so it's actually lip synced in this performance. Uh, <laughs> next slide. Well, while an early expo um, Sorry, what was I just saying to you? The following year then, after Chanson d'Amour, uh, the, uh, the Belgian plastic Bertrand, uh, his Saint Plan pour moi, a literal translation, things are great, I'm on top of the world, uh, regarded as a punk pastiche, also made an impression given those nasal vowels again, the relentless onomatic peak delivery on a single note, and the ooh, perhaps some of you remember that. Anyway, um, those of you that have heard that will understand uh, what I'm getting at. And again, this was in the UK context was something of a novelty uh, in, the, uh, in the charts at the time. 
Now, while an early exposure to French music came via the mass media and vinyl discs, other examples came from unexpected places. For, for example, watching the Channel 4 test card. Um, <laughs> The new, channel was launched in, the, the new channel was launched in 1982 and not all areas were uh, served and we had to go to great lengths uh, where we lived to, to receive it, so, uh, which involved looking at the test card. Now the test card featured a group of songs in French uh, sung by Eric Vincent as part of what I now know, thanks to enthusiasts on the internet, to be part of a larger collection of library music. And, and library music is a whole area of, of uh, study um, worthy of ex investigation. In investigation. Um, anyway, again, the, the unfamiliar words and sounds were particularly attractive in those songs. One of the songs features repeated use of the word caricature with the French U and R sounds, which to me seems so exotic com well, compared to caricature in, in English. And, and in fact, by a stroke of good fortune, I was, I was fortunate to meet the singer in Paris many years later during one of my, uh, during one of my research trips. Now, the, fo the following year, 1983, France's Eurovision entry, and the Eurovision was held in Munich, made a deep and lasting impression. Again, given the unfamiliar words and sounds, the French nasal vowels, the R sound, um, as well as the title Vivre, um, and also the um, the voicing in, it, that I discovered in, in French song of the, the silent E. Um, so vivre becomes vivre. Um, 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 uh, im, uh, im, imi, so im becomes imme, for example. So uh, this is all, all very uh, new. Um, so, um, so the title, as I said, Vivre by Guy Bonnet, and um, it was incidentally the first song to be performed in the, the contest. And uh, with the little French I had, I, it was my first year at secondary school, I, I realized that you know, it meant to live or living, and that suggested to me something quite profound, a song about living, about life, and something I would appreciate later in my studies of French song, um, in which I highlighted similar universal themes that feature such as uh, love, friendship, uh, life and death, and death features in this song too, and it's, um, of, it's often been said that it's a relative taboo in Anglophone song, uh, or at least in relation to French song, the theme of death. death. So um, the intensity of emotion and its delivery by the performer in French song is something I would later uh, appreciate, so um, I'll... And just in case you were wondering, um, for example, uh, the UK entry that year in contrast, and I think the, in cont the contrast is important, was a very catchy pop song which served to highlight the features of the French, for me, uh, highlighted the features of the French song Vivre. Um, so, just to... Okay. In my teenage years, I was further exposed to French in the formal setting of school, a class on the singer-songwriter and humanitarian Daniel Balavoine, who was tragically killed in 1986, a documentary on Georges Brassens, uh, which gave a sense of his anti-conformism and the mass appeal in France of the singer-songwriter figure, and the English translations of the Belgian singer-songwriter Jacques Brel's songs, particularly those of Mark Armand and Scott Walker. So by this time, in my early 20s, I was thinking about popular music in France as a research area uh, at a time when such studies were relatively rare in French studies, where language and the canon of French literature um, were dominant. And at, at this point, I should thank key figures in French popular music, uh, media and culture study, cultural studies, uh, notably, uh, notably Hugh Dauncey, who I'm very pleased to say is here with us tonight, David Loosley, uh, Jeff Hare, Peter Hawkins, along with my PhD supervisor at Birmingham, Ian Pickup, all of these uh, uh, colleagues for paving the way. And I should also say that a year in Grenoble as an Erasmus student, a truly life-changing experience, and a thir fur three further years in Lyon after graduation were cru crucial in developing an interest. Anyway, I hope this, in some ways, part in some ways part of my own nostalgic uh, trajectory has given you an insight into how I got into French and popular music via formal and informal channels. And while Gary's um, outlined the various areas of French culture I've been exploring over the years, one particular area which I'm going to focus on for the remainder of the lecture is nostalgia, which is a topic of, of fundamental significance, but one in the French context which illustrates some of the uh, specific uh, or general features of, um, of French culture. 
Uh, in recent years, nostalgia has become a prominent feature of the popular music and media culture of France, uh, particularly following the launch of successful tours such as Age Tendre et Tête de Bois, Young and Headstrong. Um, uh, it can be translated as. So this phenomenon is started off as an annual concert tour of France, Belgium and Switzerland, and it was launched in 2006, then followed by a Mediterranean cruise in 2008. And it featured pop singers who originally came to prominence in the 60s and 70s, uh, and the tour and, uh, uh, tour and cre the, crew, the tour and the cruise take their name from uh, Age Tendre and Tête de Bois, which was a youth TV programme in the 60s, and the name also of a, 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 a relatively short-lived youth magazine. Uh, and there you can see on this slide the poster for Age Tendre, the Age Tendre tours featuring various artists. Um, in 2007, an 80s-themed nostalgia tour began in France, very popular too, which I'm going to talk about in a little while. The, the nostalgia tours of this kind and their heavy, although not exclusive, emphasis on French-speaking artists and songs is indicative of a more general, ongoing attachment in France to homegrown popular music. French TV has produced several variety shows dedicated to popular music nostalgia, uh, often with a focus on a particular decade. Um, the variety show Les Années Bonheur, uh, Happy Years, hosted by the veteran presenter Patrick Sébastien, has enjoyed a successful run um, over the last decade in a Saturday night uh, primetime slot, featuring music performances by French, francophone and other international artists, audience participation, roundtable discussion as you can see there and reminiscence, sketches by comedians, facts and figures on the history of popular music from a uh, resident expert, uh, and um, uh, what's called a little letter, la petite lettre, which is a video sequence which is voiced over uh, by uh, Sébastien in the form of a letter. And in, and in this little letter, he pays tribute to a uh, particular um, a, a French um, inter or international popular music star who's no longer uh, living. Um, in the daytime schedules, the magazine show C'est au programme um, translate something like on the agenda. It's a kind of rough equivalent of, uh, of this morning, I suppose. And that includes a regular popular music nostalgia slot uh, presented by the pundit um, uh, chronique Frédéric Zetoun. Uh, the multi-channel TV offering in France um, also includes a niche uh, provider of nostalgia, Tele Melodie, uh, dedicated to French and international popular music from the 60s through to the 90s, um, featuring again a team of expert presenters and including in its schedules live concerts, films, documentaries, and uh, scop what's called scopitone films. I don't know if you've heard of these. These are a type of visual jukebox um, uh, which were very popular uh, in France and featuring 16 millimeter film, a kind of forerunner of the music videos. Uh, music videos also appear on, on Melody, uh, along with interviews, reports, and repeats of a variety of programmes which are broadcast in their entirety. Um, and in the slide, it's perhaps interesting to note the use, um, or the nod to Anglophone culture through the use of the English slogan, Vintage Forever. Um, as, for, as for radio in France, while music-based stations such as Nostalgie and RFM uh, broadcast French and international golden oldies, public and private general and thematic talk-based radio stations uh, such as Europe 1, France Inter, France Culture and RTL, uh, they feature discussion of uh, popular music nostalgia in terms of particular decades. Uh, also genre, music genres, uh, particularly chanson and hip-hop artists uh, to uh, French, Francophone and international and, uh, and also deal with in the talk based um, uh, on the talk based stations some of the programs deal with issues such as uh, feelings of exile and, and uh, homesickness. Now where the press is concerned regional and local newspapers perhaps more than the national newspapers and the magazine press devote extensive discussion to popular music nostalgia in the local areas that they serve and via feature articles, reviews, interviews, news in brief articles, um, announcements of specific tour dates at a particular location. And um, given the um, relatively significant volume of popular music uh, discourses on nostalgia that I've come across 
uh, in the contemporary French media, I've been attempting to situate these in terms of existing studies of nostalgia in disciplines as diverse as psychological science, sociology, media and cultural studies, popular music studies, consumer and marketing research, um, as well as studies on nostalgia's relationship with popular music uh, and the media. So, um, defined broadly as a sentimental longing for one's past, the term nostalgia from nostos, Greek for return home, and algos, Greek for pain, is now widely regarded as a common emotion or experience. Uh, as Sadikides and others observe, uh, nostalgia was regarded for centuries as a psychological ailment um, equated with homesickness, and notably that of Swiss soldiers serving abroad from the late 17th century. Several commentators have also viewed nostalgia in ambivalent terms as bittersweet, combining joy and sadness and si similar or related emotions. But more positively, um, Sadikides and others observe that nostalgia is now emerging as a fundamental human strength and is recognised as fulfilling several psychological uh, functions. Several categories or divisions of nostalgia have been highlighted in academic accounts of the phenomenon. Fred Davis identifies three orders of nostalgia, simple, reflexive and interpreted. As Davis comments, first order or simple nostalgia harbours a largely unexamined belief that things were better, more beautiful, healthier, happier, more civilised, more exciting than, than now. And I'm sure that's a feeling many of us can relate to in a variety of contexts. In, in second order or reflexive nostalgia, uh, the individual raises questions concerning the truth, accuracy, completeness or representativeness uh, of the nostalgic claim. So you might, for example, dispute someone else's nostalgic account of the past. So for example, when uh, politicians sometimes talk about making uh, countries uh, great again, for example. <laughs> The third, third order or interpreted nostalgia moves beyond um, issues of historical accuracy or, or felicity or appropriateness of the nostalgic claim on the past. And even as the reaction unfolds, so even as you're having the nostalgic reaction, questions, there's a questioning and a potentially at least rendering problematic the very reaction itself. And just to develop that, just to try and make it a bit more concrete, that third point, that third order of nostalgia, uh, Davis formulates the third order of nostalgia in, in uh, more concrete terms as a series of questions which we have there. Um, so um, you might ask yourself, as you interpret a nostalgic feeling that you're having, why am I feeling nostalgic? What may this mean for my past, for my now? Is it that I'm likely to feel nostalgia at certain times and places and not at others? And if so, when and where? What use does nostalgia serve for me, for others, for the times in which we live? Another form of nostalgia worth mentioning is what Svetlana Boim, Svetlana Boim refers to as restorative nostalgia, which stresses nostos, home, and attempts a trans-historical reconstruction of the last home doesn't think of itself as nostalgia, but actually as truth and tradition, and is at the core of recent national and religious revivals. So this again perhaps chimes with the idea I've just mentioned about making uh, countries uh, great again. The, the, the second form, reflective nostalgia, thrives on algia, the longing itself, and delays the homecoming, dwells on the ambivalences of human longing and belonging, and calls the truth into doubt. So this form then seems to challenge the idea um, that the suppose, uh, a supposed truth, uh, for example, of making a, a country great again, and might uh, view the idea of belonging to a country perhaps in more complex, uh, even ambivalent terms. So uh, while restorative nostalgia seems to protect the idea of an absolute truth, reflective nostalgia uh, calls it somehow into, into doubt. And further distinctions have been drawn between nostalgia, which is experienced first-hand, real nostalgia, and that which is experienced second-hand via the recollections and reminiscences of other individuals, what can be termed simulated or vicarious nostalgia. Um, or also historic, there's historical nostalgia in which the past is defined as a time before the audience uh, was born. So you might be nostalgic for a time before uh, you existed. Nostalgia has also been viewed as individually and collectively uh, experienced. 
Now, when nostalgia is experienced individually, the, motions, the emotion has been regarded effectively as a cushion, uh, one that offers a self-protection mechanism against death-related concerns. So for certain commentators, nostalgia is um, experienced particularly during times of disruption and discontinuity, um, as well as instability, particularly when societies are in turmoil, experiencing troubles, turbulence and transformation. Indeed, the first decade of the new millennium, the focus of my study in the French context on nostalgia, uh, Fr uh, France has experienced several waves of disruption, industrial unrest, pensions protests, for example, uh, urban and youth violence, and, con and uh, continuing uncertainty around um, following the global financial crisis. But more positively, studies have shown that nostalgic reverie is a crucial vehicle for maintaining and fostering self-continuity over time in the face of change. Uh, also countering loneliness and uh, creating social connectedness and support. Um, in the French context, while the study of cultural and collective memory um, is well established, um, focusing on turbulent or traumatic events, uh, in French history, um, notably the two world wars, the Holocaust, Al the Algerian war, the events of 1968, as well as other forms of, uh, as well as forms of remembrance, official forms of remembrance and commemoration, such as state funerals, monuments, statues, street names, anniversaries, um, education and legislation. So while these areas uh, have received coverage, there's been relatively little sustained nos discussion of nostalgia. The film actor Simon Signore's 1976 volume of memoirs, Nostalgia Isn't What It Used To Be, a title borrowed from the witticism of an un unknown New York graffiti artist found on a wall in 1959, demonstrates an interest in the interaction of memory and uh, nostalgia in uh, the development of personal histories. And more recently, a 2013 study by the philosopher Barbara Cassin, um, uh, Nostalgia, When Are We Ever at Home, explores nostalgia based on belonging and relationships between home, exile and uh, language. So turning towards popular music nostalgia and nostalgia in France, in the 1990s, France saw the popularity of um, a, a musical movement, a group of artists who Barbara Lebrun refers to as chansons uh, néo-réalistes, uh, and who, she observes, these artists copied lyrical and musical elements of 1930s chansons réalistes with, for example, the waltzing accordion, and which also focused on hardship and a sense of lost conviviality. And she says that they sought, these songs sought to show that similar social tensions were shaping contemporary French society. Now, uh, Barbara Lebrun's work on 1990s chanson néo-réaliste views this music genre in complex and at times contradictory terms, um, and a uh, translation there of a quotation, between nostalgia and conservatism, protest and so social and cultural forms of distinction, uh, reactionary and rebellious, old-fashioned and modern, elitist and collection, uh, collective. So in, in sum, nostalgic is uh, problematic on a number of levels. And more recently, Isabelle Marc uh, identifies nostalgia as a recurrent feature of the work of French singer-songwriters. Um, Georges Brassens' persona, the singer-songwriter Georges Brassens' persona is viewed as mythologizing Frenchness, which is fundamentally attached to the past uh, and is based on the universal French Republican ideal of the one and indivisible um, republic. Um, while in the case of Charles Aznavour's work, uh, Mark uh, identifies nostalgia um, as a feature of his dramatic style, as, as a means in which he um, identifies with audiences. Um, in terms of uh, nostalgia for youth, so uh, looking back uh, in time through his songs, but um, in terms of nostalgia for a lost love, perhaps, uh, and from a pr present standpoint, um, there's the idea also of future nostalgia that's to be anticipated. So, for example, in, in one particular song which Mark discusses, um, Amafi, uh, we have a narrator who imagines his daughter growing up, leaving home and marrying, so actually anticipating the nostalgia that he's going to have uh, later on. 
Uh, the relationship between nostalgia and popular music more generally is a developing area of academic inquiry beyond France. Existing studies have explored identity formation, uh, the experiences of listeners and consumers, um, cultural heritage debates too. And um, in 2014, a, an edited collection um, of essays on nostalgia published in volume at La Revue des Musiques Populaires, edited by Hugh Dancy and myself, has developed further the question of genre and nostalgia uh, with a specific focus on rock and chanson. Um, also the role of nostalgia in the construction of space and place and also the time related dimensions of popular music nostalgia. Um, the link between nostalgia media has become also uh, has also become a further um, focus of interest. Uh, Kat Katharina, Katharina Niemeyer's uh, volume focuses on the use of analog nostalgia in digitized environments, for example. Uh, the manipulation of nostalgia in areas such as marketing, advertising, uh, corporate alumni networks and the, the news, screened nostalgias and the notion of creative nostalgias and highlights how the media not only produces nostalgic meaning, but often the, me the media are very often nostalgic for themselves, their own past and their own structures and contents. Um, more specifically, popular music related nostalgia in the media is a growing area of inquiry. Um, in, in, uh, in an article focusing on the media, television and the spin-off uh, CD box set in Quebec, uh, Danny Trottier identifies a process of double nostalgia at work in which nostalgia songs are themselves treated nostalgically. Um, in the volume, uh, in the same volume there that I edited with Hugh Dancy, um, a, a study of nostalgia relating to the bands Joy Division and New Order by Alistair Gregg and Catherine Strong focuses on media, the, uh, the mediatization of nostalgia, nostalgia books, promotional materials and films. Um, the idea of ersatz or imagined nostalgia, nostalgia which is trying to stake a claim on the past. Uh, the com commercialization of nostalgia for profit, but also a more nuanced view of, of commercialization too. And uh, also the possibility of actively rejecting or at least adopting an ambiguous um, view towards nostalgia. Now, in some of my own work, um, I've compared the ways in which French and British newspaper discourse has approached nostalgia as an emotion, uh, social experience, and as a cultural value. Um, and I've been looking at this in coverage of the 1980s popular music tours uh, RFM Parti 80 in France and here and now in the UK. Similarities in French and British approaches include an emphasis on joy, the festive and imagined return to youth, unquestioning nostalgia, um, social cohesion, as well as stereotypical views of 1980s popular music and fashion as kitsch. But the study um, also reveals clear differences between national contexts. British coverage avoids taking life too seriously, but also challenges simple nostalgia and does develop complex forms. French coverage emphasizes the value of emotion, social and intergenerational cohesion, as well as national pride. The nostalgia tour is also associated in French coverage with the defense of popular culture, the resistance to perceived Parisian domination, and the development of charity and musical creativity. So having hopefully presented the work generally in the field and my own contribution, I'd like to finish with and illustrate some of my findings um, with a case study of the French RFM Parti 80 tour, uh, which I've just mentioned. I'm focusing on TV coverage of the tour, which I uh, was able to view at the French National Broadcasting Archives in Paris. Um, focusing also on the spin-off film, Star 80, and the press reviews that that film release generated. So, um, in 2007, the producers Olivier Kiefer and uh, Hugues Gentelet launched the 80s Nostalgia Tour, RFM Party 80, support, supported by RFM, the, the French uh, commercial radio station. And it's played at a variety of venues across France, including the Stade de France. Um, as I said, 2012 saw the release of a film spin-off, um, Star 80. Uh, in 2013, um, the tour was effectively replaced by a new look 1980s tour, which takes its name from the film. So together, the tour and the film illustrate the commercial appeal of 1980s nostalgia. 
Um, and uh, um, according to the online publicity, the concerts had achieved audiences totaling 3.5 million over 10 years. And the film uh, attracted uh, 1.8 million cinema goers within the first seven weeks of its release. And although um, a, a 2017 film sequel was made and, and, and was l much less successful at the box office, the tour does continue um, with dates planned uh, already into, uh, into this year. So um, the nostalgic significance then of the RFM Party 80 tour uh, it's discussed in various TV programs, variety shows, magazines, or, or a combination of both. And um, these feature individu individual members of the tour on the, on the road in filmed reports or in studio discussion. And I'll just give you a couple of, uh, one or two examples for each category just to try and illustrate the points. TV coverage emphasizes the joyful experiences of artists and audiences alike. In one particular special, the presenter Mireille Dumas describes the atmosphere at the concerts as frenzied, for example. Programming is also, uh, du délire uh, uh, in French, uh, programming is also reinforced, um, also reinforces social cohesion and bonding. For the artists taking, taking part in the tour, um, is described in a report as like being part of a holiday or summer camp in Grande Colonie de Vacances. The singer, uh, the singer Jean-Pierre Madère expresses his pleasure at meeting his mates, his copains, after 20 years apart. Generational inclusion and cohesion is also, in, is, is also hi highlighted. In one particular report, um, the um, tour audience is described as being between 15 and 65. Different generations of concert goers are interviewed. An audience member regards the tour uh, as his childhood, while another, identified as a 21-year-old, refers to it as the generation of my parents. Um, simple nostalgia for the 1980s is expressed via social, cultural, and musical comparisons with the present. Um, the uh, presenter, actor, and comic Chantal Lobby views nostalgia as an antidote to the problems of contemporary life. Um, the, moreover, the, the 80s are regarded in pos positive terms as a relatively caref a carefree time when everything seemed possible. The singer Jean-Pierre Madère refers to the attraction of uh, a less stressful time, une période moins anxiogène, anxiogène, a time when education led to employment. But on the other hand, the 1980s are viewed as a difficult decade in social terms. Um, the unemploy uh, unemployment and the AIDS crisis are cited specifically. Um, on a personal level, the singer Cookie Dingler describes the way he was exploited in the past uh, rev and refusing now to make any concessions uh, today. Um, one particular programme features a clash between the simple and the more reflexive forms of nostalgia. <laughs> okay. As long as it's not the... <laughs> okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so certainly this, con this conflict between simple and reflexive nostalgia. So in one example, the presenter, Christine Bravo, is particularly critical of today's jubilatory or joyous nostalgia, nostalgia jubilatoire, joyeuse, uh, that the tour represents, even if it can be explained in terms of the current economic crisis and austerity. And uh, Bravo eg argues that socially and politically speaking, the 80s weren't marrant, they weren't funny, uh, but merdier, um, a, 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 a mess to say the least. And um, a, dis a difficult period, citing the event of AIDS, the, the failed 1981 presidential campaign of the comic and political activist Kalush, the Iran-Iraq and Falklands Wars, the sinking of the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior by the French Secret Service in 1985, uh, and other examples. TV coverage also contributes to debates regarding the cultural status of popular music nostalgia tours. Artists' initial concerns at taking part for being seen as corny or old-fashioned rangardisme are raised in uh, programmes. And the argument is made that nostalgic audiences are drawn to specific songs rather than the artists. Um, so the production of new original material is also highlighted with re reference to uh, an album, album um, by a group called Leopold Nord et Eux and uh, their single uh, which was recorded in a hotel room during the tour. Um, so 
Echoing the experiences of the tour, the tour, produ uh, the tour producers, um, Star 80, directed by Frédéric Forestier and Thomas Langman, was released in 2012 with Richard Anconina and uh, Patrick Timsit as Antoine and Vincent, old, old friends and joint owners of a small but failing entertainment company. As a means of generating income, the duo Hatch a plan to bring together various uh, popular musicians um, who had enjoyed, and these musicians are playing themselves, um, and who had enjoyed um, commercial success during the 1980s. The film seems to recruit various artists and organise a concert tour of towns and cities across France, uh, progressing from very small uh, um, uh, towns and cities right through to eventually to the Stade de France in Paris. And um, there you have a slide from the film, which is obviously there's an, uh, a reference to the uh, Blues Brothers uh, film. So in terms of nostalgia, the film emphasizes escapism back to one's youth. The pair listen to old vinyl singles and reminisce, reminisce over record covers, just like I've been doing today, I suppose, to such an extent that the quest to recruit the artist becomes a stereotypical male midlife crisis. Vincent remortgages his home as the pair embark on a road uh, and a motorway adventure. The Nostalgia Tour is represented as, as, as an opportunity for so co social cohesion and togetherness as the various members of the group travel, singing on the coach, socialising and living together, sharing after-show meals, performing song medleys together around the piano. Um, and the closing titles feature a medal, medley of 80s songs around the, uh, the performers around the piano, with the awards appearing on the screen in karaoke style for the benefit of um, uh, cinema audiences who, who might like to join in. So although an egalitarian approach is sought by the uh, producers in the film Antoine and Vincent, an entire internal hierarchy is suggested as certain artists seek to distinguish themselves or demand special treatment. Although the representation of stars as divas is uh, admittedly for uh, comic self-ironizing and, and, and um, self-mocking effect. Um, the film features a, a variety of views on cultural, on cultural legitimacy of popular music nostalgia. While the film recognises the disdain of certain individuals for nostalgia uh, and popular music tours, for example, the record company executive who scoffs at the plans of Antoine and Vincent, the sceptical bank manager who describes the artists as has-beens, uh, and an audience member uh, who is tired of hearing the same uh, songs, uh, and describes the audience, uh, an audience as crétins, or, uh, uh, cretins. The bank manager and audience member change, we see them change their minds when they witness the popularity and commercial success of the nostalgia concerts. Um, the film also supports the idea that audiences are attached to specific or, uh, artists. So when uh, Antoine and Vincent actually try to um, they, um, perform um, a song by the group Début de Soirée, um, instead of the original group performing it, um, as an actual attempt to demonstrate that audiences are only attached to songs and not to artists, they are booed off stage, and, and so the, the original artist, Début de Soirée, returned to the stage to sing their own song. Um, so while focusing mainly on French-speaking stars and art songs, um, the international anglophone dimension of 1980s popular music nostalgia in France is conveyed, is conveyed via the use of um, illustrative hit singles in the soundtrack, such as Anola Gay by OMD, Sweet Dreams by the Eurythmics, um, Wonderful Life by Black, and Sorry Seems to be the Hardest Word by Elton John, albeit a hit in 1976 rather than uh, the 80s. And, and as I mentioned, there are visual references such as uh, the Blues Brothers uh, film that I just mentioned there uh, with Antoine and Vincent with wearing dark sunglasses. Press reviews of the film are for the most part divided between mixed and negative reviews. While questioning the quality of the production, storyline and its execution, they view popular music nostalgia in the film as an experience which is emotional, touching, sentimental and empathetic. On occasion as shameful, uh, as populist, uh, as an opportunity for audiences to participate in the festive and as an escape from the current financial crisis um, and as an opportunity for self-mockery and derision. 
but also as a cynical commercial uh, opportunity too. So to finish with, um, just what I'd like to, uh, I'd, I'd just like to kind of draw things together and, and say that what I've talked about is part of a larger uh, book, and book and dissemination project on the media, popular music and nostalgia in France. Specifically, how media coverage associates nostalgia with specific songs, albums, genres, music genres, performance venues, such as concert halls, music festivals, cultural associations, and care homes. And these are covered, particularly in the uh, written media. How, they contrib how coverage contributes towards raising the status of particular artists and their work by focusing on particular career stages, uh, the mourning of dead stars, the celebration of death anniversaries, uh, and also the work of tribute acts known in, uh, or impersonators known as sozi in uh, French. Uh, also looking at how coverage views nostalgia both as a defining quality of music and performance, and how nostalgia combines with other musical, artistic or aesthetic qualities. Um, but also how uh, coverage regards nostalgia as necessary, but also at times in problematic, and as I mentioned before, sometimes in shameful terms. Coverage represents the relationship between popular music consumers and audiences and nostalgia in a variety of ways, both emotional and sometimes physically too. Uh, nostalgia is viewed as an unintentional, spontaneous response, as an overwhelming force that carries powerless audiences away. Coverage identifies a latent, dormant form of nostalgia within concert goers, ready to be reawakened. Nostalgia is also represented as a conscious need on the part of audiences and an experience actively sought. And audiences are represented as consciously yielding or surrendering to nostalgia. And um, I, I don't really recall seeing that, th those kinds of discourses uh, in English. Um, um, so, how, uh, also looking at how far media coverage of popular music nostalgia contributes towards maintaining the unified or unitary notion of French and, and other national identities, and also thinking about how coverage views generations, either bringing them together perhaps or creating generation gaps, and also uh, it, thinking about nostalgia in terms of time-specific decades and periods. So, um, as I've been developing the project, I've been able to present some of my finding, findings at various public engagement events. Uh, events. Uh, Hugh Doncy and I were uh, invited to present the edited volume I showed you um, on popular music and nostalgia uh, in 2015 at La Gaîté Lyrique Cultural Centre in Paris in a roundtable discussion involving writers, journalists, journalists academics, um, and which was open uh, to the general public as well. Now, while there are opportunities to inform media production and journalistic practice, more closer to home, I've been presenting some of the findings to local branches of the University of the Third Age. Now, for those of you that don't know the U3A, it's an international movement. And so in the UK, with just over a thousand uh, local branches and uh, over 400,000 members, which is, and I quote, open to all in their third age, which is defined not by a particular age, but by a period in life in which full-time employment has ceased, whose members promote the values of lifelong learning and the positive attitudes of belonging to a U3A. And U3A branches form interest groups covering a wide range of topics and activities um, uh, by the members for the members. And indeed, some of the branches include music groups and um, more specifically nostalgia groups in their range of um, in interest groups. And as, 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 um, as the U3A states, no qualifications are sought or offered. Learning is for its own sake, with enjoyment being the prime motive not qualifications or awards. There's no, dis and I continue, they, they continue, there's no distinction between learners and teachers. They are all U3A members. So through the initial presentations in, in the, and interaction that I've had with local U3As via public lectures um, on po popular music and, and nostalgia, <clears throat> it seems that engagement with the subject is of potential value in uh, contributing towards developing individuals into cultural awareness, 
media literacy and well-being. Uh, but that is all for the, uh, the future. Um, and at the same time, nostalgia is of relevance to those in the earlier stages of life and, and also can apply to relatively recent uh, periods um, as the existence of no notice nostalgia, for example, would um, seem to confirm. So while, while other people talk and write about popular music, nostalgia in the media, and myself included. Um, as this snap from last June's Let's Rock Retro Festival in Dalkeith Country Park shows, <laughs> it's also, I think it's also instructive to experience uh, and reflect upon our own popular music and nostalgic choices and practices. Thank you very much. <laughs>